Hello everyone, welcome to this video on Socrates and the allegory of the cave. So we've said the Western tradition of philosophy uh, really begins in ancient Greece, and it wasn't really a united country. They had what were called sort of city-states, and sometimes they were friendly and sometimes they were at war, but they were reasonably civilised compared to other parts of the world at the time. And uh, what, what we have in Athens is we have what's an approximate democracy and they're, they're polytheistic, so they have their Greek gods of Zeus and Poseidon and Athena. Um, and it's really here in Athens and, and in, in, in larger Greece that philosophy or Western philosophy uh, really starts to emerge. So Greece, um, beautiful country. So we've got the white sandy beaches here. This is an image of, um, of Athens and there at the top, the temple. And here uh, we have a painting from the School of Athens by Raphael. So there we've got all the philosophers sitting around chatting. Here's Plato and uh, here's Aristotle. So that, this is where it all starts to emerge is in ancient Greece. Um, and so we have this guy Socrates who never wrote any of his own books, uh, but rather we come to know him through Plato, who Plato claims to be a student of Socrates. Uh, and he's born around two and a half thousand years ago. And he's really credited as, um, as the sort of ultimate philosopher or, or the, um, the, real, the real founder of the Western tradition of philosophy. Um, so, yeah, so I said Plato, uh, Plato is how we learn about Socrates. So Plato's got a number of books. Um, and so here's Socrates. And in this image here, this is, depicts Plato and uh, Aristotle having a conversation. And... Um, Socrates is portrayed as someone who's very wise, uh, but also very, very humble. And he's mocked as a gnat. So a, a gnat is like a, a, a march fly that would come along and sting you uh, because he's someone who would ask people annoying questions. And Socrates um, observed many people sort of caught up in this superficial way of living. Uh, they weren't, they were just sort of living on the surface. And he would ask them questions and always trying, trying to get them to think about things differently. And this often annoyed a lot of people uh, because he would point out inconsistencies in their ideas or make them, um, uh, make them confused and angry. Uh, so this is how he became known as a gnat. Uh, and he's eventually put to death by the people of Athens for corrupting the youth. He became known as a corrupter of youth. So through, through Socrates, we hear the, um, the allegory of the cave. And I'm, I'm going to describe it to you just how, um, how maybe you've encountered it before in sort of a simplistic term, and then I'll get into really how um, Plato describes it uh, through Socrates. So the way I've described it historically, as I've said, you know, imagine that you're born in a cave and you've sort of lived your whole life inside this cave with your family. You've never been outside before. Everything you've encountered is in, inside this cave. Um, and then one day you find this sort of opening or this exit out of the cave and you sort of go and inspect and you step out into the grass and the fields and you see the, uh, you see the, the sky and the clouds and the sun and you're like, wow, this place is absolutely amazing. There's, there's so much here to see. And it, it's all really shocking to you because you've never seen any of it before. Uh, and you go back into the cave and then you're trying to describe uh, describe this cave to the people you know, who live in the cave with you, that is your family and friends. And it's very difficult to find the language that suits. So, so this, um, this is sort of a limited, limited idea of it. You know, the, the idea is that you're living in the cave at the moment and that as philosophers, our, our journey is to try and step outside of the cave um, to, to see things as they really are. Um, and so like a, a, another analogy might be, you know, the school of fish swimming in the ocean. So that you know, they have no idea about uh, about your existence up here um, on the earth, about laptops and philosophy and um, and and real schools and the internet. You know, they're just living their life, eating their vegetation or other smaller fish, um, just going about their business, like literally copying everything that all of the other fish do. You know, they they sort of have no autonomy. They're completely dependent on the school. Um, so, that, so that's a similar analogy, but this, this way of describing it is, it's an interesting way of thinking about the allegory of the cave. 
um, but it sort of does fall short a bit. So I will get into the way that Socrates describes it. Um, so one thing I should just say as well is that word allegory, uh, that just means allegory. It just means it's like a, um, it's a story is, is the simplest translation. It's a story that has a deeper meaning. It might be a, a more a, a, a more precise way to describe it. So this is the way that Socrates describes it, okay, is he, he does build it up a bit and it is a little bit more complex than this image, but basically what you have is you have this guy who's chained up, okay, and he's inside a cave, um, and because he's inside a cave, it's dark, but there is this artificial light source, like a fire, or, or you could think maybe a torch in it if you, if you were going to perform it in um, today's day and age, uh, an artificial light source. And then people are walking in front of the light source with objects, okay, be it birds or bird puppets or whatever it is. And these are producing shadows on the wall. And so then these people living inside the cave, they're not seeing, uh, not seeing reality for what it is. They're seeing a shadow of what it is. Now, the reason it's different from, uh, the reason the allegory of the cave is different from the scenario I, I described uh, prior is that here the fish are, in a way, they're fenced off from a, a large part of the world. They don't have the intellectual capacity or the means to access uh, reality as it truly is, okay? Whereas here the guy in the cave, um, what, what, what the way Socrates might describe it is that he, he can see all things, like say he might have real birds or real people walking past, but he only sees shadows of them. So he's sort of got access to all of reality, but it's a shadow of what it truly is. Um, and so if you think of, well, what is a shadow? It's, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's a two-dimensional image of, of something that, of, of a light beam on incident on an object, isn't it? So it's a, um, it's a, it's a, it's a dull approximation of what the thing truly is. And so that's his claim, is that we only see these sort of dull approximations of what something truly is. Um, and the other point he's making as well is that we are in this predicament, we are imprisoned in this cave, like fir firstly by our social conditioning, but also because we're willful and complicit uh, in our ignorance. And so for philosophers, our journey is one out of the cave, where our aim is to, to step outside the cave. And the, you know, stepping outside the cave, you're, you're blinded by the sunlight. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt your eyes. Um, to see things as they are is going to hurt your eyes. And so sort of the, the truth will hurt. But as philosophers, you know, we're, not, we're, we're ultimately after what is real and true rather than what's sort of comfortable and illusory. We want to know. What is it at the most fundamental? Uh, what what is the, the, the most fundamental nature of reality? Reality at its truest. So that's that's the whole um, pursuit of philosophy: is stepping outside of the cave um, and and willfully um, willfully pursuing that which is true.